Greta Carpenter could make Jingle Bell sad, couldn't she? You know, that's the only, that's the only thing about that. But um, all right, folks, well, we are going to get back into the book of Acts. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 10 today. So let's do a quick review, though, where we've been. Uh, the book of Acts starts off, we have the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a big thing, obviously. Uh, Jesus promises the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does come and the church is born. And it's uh, when, the, when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, it's really a, a big, uh, kind of a dramatic, noticeable thing, you know. Uh, Jesus talks about preaching the gospel to uh, Judea, Samaria, and to everywhere in the world to start in that order. And that's what, that's what is done. Uh, the church is a unique entity that God has created, uh, much like he did with the nation of Israel. And uh, we have a specific purpose, a specific job. Uh, we are the ecclesia, the called out. Called out from what? Called out from the world. And, you know, to preach the gospel, to stand for righteousness, not haughtily or proudly, but in a, in a way that, that, um, that honors Christ, we're to defend the faith. And so the church is a multifaceted program that God has instituted uh, to further his unfolding plan uh, of redemption. Uh, we, we were, as we go along in the book of Acts, we see early growth. Uh, we see a lot of people getting saved. Uh, we see also persecution uh, start to happen more and more. And guess who the persecutors are most of the time? I mean, the Romans, yeah, but it was really the religious people of the day. Uh, the, uh, the Pharisees and, and the Sanhedrin and that, all that sort of thing, they were the ones doing most of the persecuting of, of this new way, the Christian, uh, uh, the, the church, as it were. So uh, those were, again, some of the highlights of the book of Acts. Uh, we see some of, the, some of the wins, some of the mistakes. You know, we see... Peter, this great transformation of Peter, uh, who is really becoming more and more uh, sanctified, who uh, is giving great sermons, great history lessons about the Old Testament, great witness about Jesus Christ. He performs some miracles in the power of Jesus' name. And again, there's persecution, there's threats to not ever, you know, mention Jesus' name again, but they keep right on mentioning the name of Jesus Christ and, and praising his name and proclaiming it as well. Uh, Stephen, we, we see Stephen, this great sermon in Acts chapter 6, I believe it is, but where Stephen gives a complete commentary on the Old Testament, talking about Jesus, gives a history lesson, gives a testimony of Christ, uh, gives witness and uh, is a martyr because he dies for his faith as he looks up and he sees heaven opened and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father and welcoming him into heaven as Saul of Tarsus was holding the coat while the execution took place. And then we see this miracle of this uh, road to Damascus moment that Saul of Tarsus has where Jesus comes and he says, Paul or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul of Tarsus becomes the Apostle Paul, saved, regenerated, reborn in Christ and will be uh, just a great, great force um, for the furthering of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is something that we had talked about in um, the last message I gave, which was about Peter's confession. And what we meant by confession was, it was really more of a proclamation that Peter made. Remember, uh, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Well, they say you're Elijah. They say you're, you know, John the Baptist reborn and so on. What, you know, and, and then Jesus said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, and so when we, we talked about all the different variances and nuances of the Greek language and how what Jesus said to Peter is, is that you are Petra, you are like the rock at, out of the big rock. What's the big rock? The big rock is the proclamation you made that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And upon that rock, that rock, that proclamation, that confession of Peter, that Jesus would build his church. 
And Jesus also tells Peter an interesting thing then too. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. And we talked about some of the scholars and what their take on that is, is that Peter in the book of Acts, and we're going to see it here again in Acts chapter 10, that Peter was present during all of these different people groups who got saved. So remember Jesus said to the Jews, to Judea, to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles. And that Peter had a prominent role in each of those events. And it was really kind of stunning when you go back and look at some of the ways that Peter was brought into this. And this will be another example of it here in Acts chapter 10. So, without any further ado, let's, let's jump in. Gene, what page are we on here? Is that me? 1168. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. That sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? <laughs> the Italian cohort. Uh, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Now this is interesting because uh, Cornelius was a centurion. He was a Roman. He had a lot of responsibility. You don't get to become a centurion unless you are a serious person, a respected person, an able person. And this was Cornelius. And there would be some natural animus because, you know, the Jews would look at, at him and say, you know, hey, this guy is part of the, the, the he's like the occupier. You know, he's, he's of the Roman guard. You know, he's no friend of ours. But on the other hand, you did have... Jews that would look at God-fearing Gentiles and have a certain respect. So it was kind of a, uh, a double-edged sword here with this. But this was, a, this was a serious man. And this is a man that, like other centurions that, that are mentioned in the New Testament, are put in a good light. You remember the centurion that Jesus talked to when it was his daughter or his son? I think it was his daughter, wasn't it? Who needed the healing. And Jesus said, okay, I'll come with you. And the, and the centurion said, Lord, I know that all you need to do is say the word. And she'll be healed. Remember Jesus, he said, I have not seen such faith like this. I, basically, I wish there was a lot more of it. So, um, so we have Cornelius. Now, one of the things that comes to light for me right away with this is that being a Roman, he would have been influenced by the culture of Rome. So they had this pantheistic sort of look or more, more of a pantheon of gods. You know, Mercury and Jupiter and on it goes. So, too often, we've talked about how culture defines religion. And everybody starts to think that's what it's all about. So if you're an American, well, it's been a Christian culture, so you're an American, you must be a Christian. Or that it's the, the, the Americans are the ones that, that have the Christianity because that's part of the culture and so forth. And, and the people in Israel, there are Jews. And the people in India are Hindus. And the people in you know, Iraq and Iran are Muslims. And, and that's how people look at things. People in China are Buddhists because they identify everything culturally. But one of the things that we see all throughout Scripture, all throughout the history of the world, is that God reaches people wherever they're at. God reaches people wherever they're at. It doesn't matter what country they're in. It doesn't matter what their walk of life is. God will reach people for Christ. And so here you have this guy Cornelius. Now, he wasn't going along with the culture of what he was accustomed to. Did being in Israel, in, 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 the, in the land of Judah, uh, you know, kind of have a, a, an influence on him? Maybe, maybe. But folks, remember we talked about how no one's going to come to Christ unless God draws that person. Okay, it's not going to happen. If, if God said today, you know, I am not going to call out to anybody anymore. They're going to have to figure it out for themselves. You know, it, well, but it would certainly contradict what he said in Scripture, but, so that's never going to happen. But beyond that, we would have to look and say no one would be able to just say, you know, I'm going to walk away from my paganism. You know, I'm not going to do this pantheon of gods. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I am going to try to find the real, true God. Apart from God's drawing that person, no one's going to do that on their own. And yet what we've discovered is, through Scripture itself, is that God is calling all the time. 
Is He not? He's calling always. And we, we, we went down the list, which I, I won't go into the whole thing, but, you know, you look at the heavens, God is calling. You look at life, God is calling. You know, you feel that twang of guilt, God is calling. Uh, you know, the birth of a baby, God is calling. When, when somebody comes up and gives you the gospel, God is calling. When you think that something is right or wrong and you look at something as an absolute moral evil and something as an absolute moral good, God is calling. And so God is always calling and we respond to that light that we're given. And it's, it's an interesting kind of almost simultaneous thing because God is providing the light and we are walking in that light, which I'll get to in just a little bit. And the more light we walk in, the more light God gives us. And so it does sort of have this reciprocal kind of a, a, a momentum where um, we are earnestly seeking God, responding to the light he's given us. And that's why God will lead people to Jesus Christ as they continue to respond to that light. And, uh, you know, folks, even back then, even way back then, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, the Hubble telescope. Uh, we, we couldn't see the evidence. Uh, we didn't have physics. We, so back then, they didn't know the, the unbelievable evidence for the beginning of the universe, for the cosmological constants, this fine-tuning of the universe, where there are hundreds of parameters with which the universe sits. They can't move one iota or life couldn't be possible. So we know that now. Okay, uh, we know that just with a microscope, with an electron microscope, we we delve down and we see the unparalleled, complex functionality and design of all living things, from the finished product that we see here. But when you drill down and drill down and drill down and drill down, it is screaming purposeful design. They didn't have that then. We've got it now, and so just as Paul said. In Romans chapter 1, there is no excuse for not believing in God. Zero. Zero excuse. Because the evidence is too overwhelming. The problem is, when the light is given, people run from the light. They reject the light. Okay? But even back then, Cornelius, and, and, and if they're following God's lead, would have to know that things can't come from nothing. Things can't come from absolutely nothing. Even back then, they would have known, you know, there's got to be, at some point, an unmoved mover. A primary cause, or nothing could be. They wouldn't have to be, you know, uh, geniuses at, at philosophy to understand that. If God is calling, and God is giving that light, people can respond. And so Cornelius was a man who was walking in the light that God gave him. And we're going to see how that's going to lead to bigger and better things for everybody. Uh, he, so he was, uh, and he, he, he was a, a giving man. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. In verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius... And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, this is interesting here because this is a Gentile that God goes directly to, speaks to directly. And uh, how much that must have meant to Cornelius. How much, how scared he was at first. I mean... This is pretty direct. This is right there. But notice how Cornelius responds. And we're going we're gonna to compare that to Peter in just a minute. What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So Cornelius is a man walking in light. He responds to that light. He gets more light. And he doesn't run from it. He's rightfully in awe. But he asks, Lord, what is it? The Lord gives him a direction, and, um, and he follows it. 
Now what's interesting here about Joppa is, is that uh, as we're going to see this unfold, uh, Peter is a prophet who's going to go to the Gentiles. And, it's, and the launching point is Joppa. Uh, you remember who else uh, had a divine appointment in Joppa? Jonah. He was going to preach to the Gentiles too. But what happened with him? Turned around and ran the other way. And um, so we're not going to see that same thing repeated here, which is very cool. So in verse 9, the next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop, on the housetop, about the sixth hour to pray. So this is, you know, people did that. You know, that, that was like a patio. They went up on, on the rooftop and, you know, they entertained and, you know, hung out and did barbecues and that sort of thing. Um, in verse 10, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise Peter, kill and eat. So what does Peter say? By no means, Lord. <laughs> For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So here, we, you know, and again, we, we see still Peter has grown tremendously in his faith. He has become a leader in this new movement, this new program that God has instituted called the church. He is one of the leaders of the body of Christ. The bride of Christ is Peter. And yet still, still, he has that little bit of Peter in him, you know, where he just can't help himself. Here, the Lord comes to him. And what does he say? Not so, Lord. No. I, I've never done that. I've never eaten that kind of stuff. And it's not going to happen now either. I mean, that's what you're going to get it, getting from this. Not so, Lord. And you see his response, being in a position of leadership, having touched and been right with Jesus. And here you've got Cornelius, who's just walking in light, hasn't had that same privilege that Peter had. And what does Cornelius do? What is it, Lord? What, can I do? what do you want me to do? And he does it right away. Peter's got to be convinced. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. You think it's a coincidence that it was three times? How many times did Jesus, did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus, before the ascension, did Jesus ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? There's, there's all these, you know, connected points here. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Verse 17, now while Peter was inwardly, and we'll get back to the food thing about this in just a, you know, a little bit here, but... Just we'll table it for now. Uh, now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you were looking for. What is your reason for coming? So it's interesting what's going on here, folks, is that God is preparing the heart of Cornelius. He is preparing the heart of Peter. Both are in kind of different, different worlds right now, but God is working this together for a purpose, as he always does. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he, Peter, invited them in to be his guests. Chuck Smith said a couple of times as he was you know, writing a commentary, he said, the walls are breaking down, the walls are breaking down. And the walls are breaking down here. Because what does Peter do? 
Peter invites Gentiles into his house. This was unheard of. This was unheard of back then. Even if there were some Jews who said, you know, these God-fearing Gentiles, they're okay in my book, they still were not going to associate with each other. They still were not going to, you know, come together for a meeting or break bread together. I mean, they had, in some ways, they had such an animus. I read that where, you know, the Pharisees, if they were walking down the street, you know, they had their robes. And if they were coming past somebody who was a, was a Gentile, they pulled those robes even tighter because they wouldn't want the robe to, you know, flit out and accidentally touch one of the Gentiles because then they'd become unclean. I mean, this is, you know, the mentality you're dealing with. But here Peter says, come on in. Come on in. Walls are coming down here. Peter is responding now to what God is telling him. He had that little bit of a blip of, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. But then as he continues to listen to God and pray, uh, it starts to become clearer. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. <laughs> but Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I too am a man. Now we know what happens when people who aren't God try to receive worship. Uh, you know, Satan comes to mind. Uh, uh, he really pushed it and that's what he wanted and that's part of why we're in this dilemma. You can understand Cornelius. He's got to know if the Lord came to me in a vision and told me to get this guy, this guy's got to be somebody important. The Lord is directly telling me to bring him to me. He's here now. And Cornelius probably just gets really excited. He's again, he's walking in light. He's, he's a, a man who fears God. He doesn't know about the gospel yet, but he's about to find out. But he falls down and worships Peter. Now, folks, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. You know, people are people. And how tempting might it be to have somebody bow at your, your feet, you know, as just a human being? How tempting is that to get that rush of, uh, of, of uh, power and, and uh, privilege and all that sort of thing? But Peter didn't do that, obviously. And not, what I love about what Peter did here, too, is that he didn't just say, you know, what, what he could have said is, hey, look, you're a Gentile, okay? I, I understand what you're doing here, but, uh, you know, you probably shouldn't do it. I mean, I know, you know, yeah, I, I was with Jesus, and, you know, uh, you know, I was with him, you know, through thick and thin, but, you know, stand up. But he didn't do that. <laughs> he didn't, like, sort of, you know, put, put on airs about who he was. He just said, stand up. I am a man, too. I've got a responsibility that God has given me, and now you're about to get one too. But we're both men, so stand up. Stand up. I think it's, it's a great moment. But, okay. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. More walls coming down. Now, <laughs> Peter invited uh, the Gentiles into his house, and, and I think it's the King James that says he lodged them. And in the Greek language, that really means is that he was full out entertainment. You know, he lodged these people, he brought them in, they were his guests, he took good care of them. So that was one no no, but now an even bigger no no is that he's actually going into the house of a Gentile. And we're going to see in chapter 11 when we get there uh, that this was not met with. Uh, um, with great tidings by, by some of the other people. You want them to the house of a Jew or a Gentile? And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. Um, Peter could have uh, exhibited pride when Cornelius fell down to worship him. Cornelius could have exhibited pride right there too. What, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What do you, what do you, what do you mean? You, you're not worthy, you know, you shouldn't be coming into my house. People would get that way, right? 
Who are you? <laughs> you don't want to come into my house? Get out. The pride factor could take over anybody, folks, even if somebody is a Christian. you got to make good decisions in life. You know, even as a believer, I've, believe me, I've, I've made dumb choices. You know, it's going to happen. And we read about all these things in the Bible. We read about the good decisions and the bad decisions. We read about, you know, gosh, why did people do those things? But then we also read the redemption that comes in on the back end because God is a loving and forgiving God. In verse 30, and Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Two hearts prepared, and many more by extension. Cornelius and Peter, Jew, Gentile, but about to become united in Christ as part of the church. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. And again, we'll get back to that in a second too. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of the peace, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day, and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose um, from the dead. Peter is really bringing the point home that the resurrection is real, and God talked to you, okay? He sent for me, I'm coming to you and I'm telling you the gospel. I'm telling you why God has brought me here to deliver the greatest news, the best news of all time, that Jesus Christ loves you, died for your sins, and that he rose again. And not only that, but that we were there. We talked to him. We ate with him and drank with him after his resurrection. This must have been just so exciting to hear. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. It's right in the middle of, of, the, of the witnessing. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. So the Jews were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Poured out even on the Gentiles. And, you know, it's interesting here, folks, because there was obviously, uh, you know, well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me go on. Let me read verse 46. For they were hearing him speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Again, more walls coming down, more recognition. These are brothers now. We're brothers in Christ. Yeah, there's a culture here and there's a culture there, and that's fine. But we are united in Jesus Christ. Because you have to understand, Cornelius wasn't the first Gentile to be saved. There were probably others, but what happened before Cornelius is that when people got saved, Gentiles, they really became Jews. They adopted the law of Moses. They went through all the rituals and the rites. And so basically, you know, they were, they were now Jews. 
But what is being talked about here is that, look, that's not what this is about. And that's okay, but being united in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing. And um, you don't have to become a Jew to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's, that's one of the points of this. So they just broke out into speaking in tongues and magnifying God. And everybody was amazed, and Peter said that wonderful thing, can water be withheld from baptizing these people? No. They're going to be baptized. Now, sometimes, you know, you, you have these great feelings. People get, when they get saved, sometimes people are on cloud nine. You know, sometimes they're just happy as all get out. The joy that they feel is overwhelming. But not everybody has a feeling. Not everybody has that emotional reaction. You remember what C.S. Lewis said? C.S. Lewis said that he was the most reluctant convert in all of England. The hound of heaven he referred to as God. The hound of heaven always coming after him. Always presenting that truth. And C.S. Lewis was just, no, did I really want it? No, but God would not let up. And so, I had to come to him because there was just no other way. So sometimes people have great feelings. Sometimes they don't. Um, but sometimes people can take a particular text and they build a whole theology around it. Folks, this is not recorded here so that we say this is what should happen to everybody who believes. They should just immediately burst out into these you know, uh, uh, great manifestations of the Holy Spirit and, and be you know, on cloud nine. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about this last night uh, as I was preparing and, and you know I, I really don't know when I was saved. Somebody said, well, what's the day you actually got saved? I don't know. I know for a long time I believed Jesus. I love Jesus because I knew he was somebody special. And I knew he died for my sins. And I watched Ben-Hur and the King of Kings in the robe several times, so I knew my stuff. And, um, but I would get those feelings from time to time. And then I remember being in high school and then the movie Jesus of Nazareth came out. I remember it was made, NBC, it was made for TV. Anybody ever see that? I haven't seen it in years, but I, from what I recall, a lot of people said that was pretty biblically accurate. And I remember seeing that movie and watching it and just falling in love with Jesus. It's like, wow. Wow. And I, I remember being so happy. One of the... I, the high school I went to was right down the street from the apartment complex we lived in. And um, so, and I, I did after school activities and stuff like that, football, basketball, and so forth. And I remember when I leave the high school, you know, it was just a short run. But, and I was never a speed merchant, but I can't imagine running that fast now. As I look back, I, I was flying, but I would run home from the school and I would tear across the street, and I would run through the courtyard and past the pond, and the whole time I'd run, and I was, I was dodging tacklers, you know, as I was, I was going through, you know? And I loved doing that. But I remember after seeing Jesus of Nazareth, I remember, you know, running through that courtyard with an exceptional bounce in my run. It was more than just a sprint. I was, I was elated. And that's good. And folks, that's what's going to be for all eternity times a million for us. Okay? But in our lives here, sometimes that doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes that feeling doesn't come. Uh, sometimes we don't feel our faith. And that's why we need to rely not on feelings, but on the truth of Scripture. The truth of what God has given us in His Word. That's how we know the fact from the fancy. That's how we know when false theology comes along, because God has given us the proper theology. I remember, you know, going through some struggles, uh, gosh, about 20, over 20 years ago, and um, I went over to Moraine Valley and saw Clem Billhorn, and uh, Clem was the guy that married Christy and I, and um, he said, look, he said, you know, you're not always going to be on cloud nine, Dave, just because you're a believer. You know, you're not always going to feel it. 
You're not always going to be running around like I did when I was in high school, running through the through the apartment complex. And uh, and Clem said, he said, you know, some of our Pentecostal friends, he said, they think there's something wrong when they're not on cloud nine. He, he didn't get specific about any particular denomination or sect. He just that's what he mentioned. But I never forgot that, and that was helpful. Um, but it doesn't always happen that way. It did here for a reason, and God listed that reason, and we should take great joy in reading it, but don't build a theology around it. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of who? Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now, I, we're, we're kind of late here, so I want to go through this quick. Here's some takeaways from Acts chapter 10. Uh, first of all, uh, when J. Vernon McGee talked about something called spirit-led evangelism. And I, I like this. He, 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 said, he said, look what happened here with Peter and Cornelius. You know, Cornelius responded and Peter responded, but both of their hearts were being prepared. And, and J. Vernon McGee's advice was, look, you know, you want somebody in particular that you want to talk to, you want to be saved, you want to give them the gospel, you better pray first. Pray for that person. Let God prepare your heart as the deliverer of the gospel and theirs as well. Ask that their hearts be prepared um, to hear it. Spirit-led evangelism. And he said that that did serve him well. So I thought that was a, an interesting bit of advice. Uh, also that when Peter gives the gospel... Uh, here he doesn't just talk about resurrection. He doesn't just talk about the cross. He talks about both the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, you can't have the resurrection without the death. But without the resurrection, the death doesn't complete it. Uh, it it's it's a combination of the two things. So the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, it is. Let me get to the food thing here because I know that that's probably on a lot of people's minds too. Um, God didn't put that vision before Peter just to make a comparison to say that what God has made clean you shouldn't call common. It related to the food too even though there was a probably a greater application which was I know what Jews think of Gentiles. They're not unclean. I have reached out to them too, and what I have made clean, don't you dare call common. But getting back to the food thing, though, God didn't put it in there for no reason. And we have other support in Scripture to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, Jesus in Mark 7. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated? Thus, he purified all foods. Okay? Um, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. This is Romans 14. Therefore, let no one judge you in food or drink which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So... The food thing, we are under grace. If we look at a particular food and we say, hey, I don't want to eat that, uh, that's not for me, uh, then you don't. But the problem becomes when you make it a demand of the church and you connect it to Christ. Now you're engaged in legalism. And this is what you know the New Testament talks quite a bit about too. Um, so... Yes, the food thing was somewhat secondary in Acts chapter 10, but when you combine it with the rest of Scripture and just look at the very fact that it was in Acts chapter 10, uh, you know, we don't have to feel guilty about eating bacon. But if, if, again, if that's something you decide, hey, I don't want to do that, that's cool. That's between you and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. Um, it's amazing the way uh, we are conditioned and the way they were conditioned back then, even in that culture that they have to kind of go through all these things to realize, hey, the Gentiles are just like us. You know, uh, they, they, um, they received the gospel. And 
it, it's just amazing to me, folks, that the people back then who had control of the scripture, who knew the scriptures, didn't recognize that the gospel, that the promises of God were always for all people. They were never just for the Jews. They had to know that. They had to look at Adam and Eve, and they weren't Jews. Noah wasn't a Jew. Everybody up till before Abraham wasn't a Jew. Now, God created the nation of Israel. They had a very special purpose, and they have a, a, a future that's, that's still on the table, obviously. But um, they were not the only ones who would be blessed. In fact, God told Abraham, all the nations of the earth, earth are going to be blessed because of this covenant that I'm making uh, with you. Um, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Uh, there are all sorts of admonitions in the Old Testament, even before there was an Israel and after there was an Israel, that talked about the Gentiles. Even Simon, when Jesus was born, talked about he was a light for the Gentiles as well. So the way we get conditioned in a culture can drown out what Scripture teaches, and that's what we've got to avoid. But that's what was going on. And that's why, you know, God had to go through all these things to get people to wake up and say, look, you know, they are part of this as well. And they're going to be in the church together. Jews and Gentiles, this new entity called the church. And, uh, and finally, um, walking in, in the light. We walk in the light we have. And we ask for more light. And to, and much is given to those who continue to go on that path. We have in this situation, Cornelius and his household is saved. Peter is sanctified more. A major step for him as an individual, but also for the church. But what's the thing that united these words? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ. That's the key. That is the ultimate key to all of this. Jew, Gentile, wherever you are in Christ Jesus. That's what we need to be all about. Let's let's stand for a closing word. Thank you heavenly Father for uh, your love. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for, Lord, the way that you just, you spell all these things out and give us the depth of Scripture that we, if we study it in concert with prayer, Lord, we'll be led to so much. That light that you've given us, Lord, will walk in more light as we continue to, to seek you with all of our heart. So, Father, we pray that each one of us uh, grows in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus, that you guide us in all things that we can make good decisions on what to do how to witness when to witness um, in everything in all the decisions we do father we thank you that we are the recipients of the truth and your love bless us as we go our separate ways we thank you in christ's name amen